So in order for us to meet the robots, we must first change our own perspectives on the world. In order to do that, I need you all to find me. I'm moving around, that's right. Your perspective when you came into here is to look at the stage. But the first objective of this talk is to change your perspective. And now we've achieved that, I'm going to go and get a coffee. OK, good. So now you've all changed your perspective, we can start the talk. I have a job title, I'm a transformation director. I'm also a human being. And to talk about robots, we must remember that we are human beings. We're variable and our world is variable, which is why you need to look around. So this is me and my little girl, Iris. Uh, this is her first skiing trip. I don't know how many times I've been skiing before. When we went skiing, I felt I was going to be the great leader, teaching her a new skill. Um, and she was going to be in awe of her father and all his greatness. What I learned in here, though, is leading the way is not actually about being the first mover. It's about being the first follower. Because Iris was following me, and I was leading her. But with her, the most precious thing to me in the world, between my knees, careering down the slopes, giggling, giddy, egging me on, saying, go faster, go faster, come on, let's do more. I came away from that holiday a much better skier than years of teaching and coaching on the slopes from professional instructors. And so what I learned was, it wasn't my leading that took us further. It was her following my lead. And so in order for us to understand that, to really get into the robots, I'm not going to talk about the technicalities of it. I want to talk to you about why we should be doing robotics. Because if we don't understand that, then we can't follow the right path. The fourth revolution is changing our world. Has anybody seen this comparative image before? OK, somebody shout out. We'll have a bit of participation. I'd love to come over, but I've been told that there's a white line of death here. And if I step over it, our robot's going to come and remove me instantly from the stage. So let's have a, a voice. What, what are these images showing us? Shout it out. It's the papal inauguration, that's right. So on the far side is 2005, the new pope, the Catholic Church, bringing their leaders to the stage. Everybody's looking up at the front, using the highly evolved human eyeball. It's great, all except that lady at the bottom who wants to be famous and saw the camera. Come on, in eight years' time, and here we are, and the same crowd, devout Catholics in St. Mark's Square, uh, not St. Mark's Square, in the Vatican. Uh, I'm confused by it. we're in the Venetian, right? I've gone all, all weird on Italian. But now, look, they're observing the same traditional process through a one-inch screen on a smartphone, all except this show-off guy here who got the first iPad. But what we can see here is that the digital revolution is changing our most traditional and historic human things. So it means that our expectations are changing. And I'm sure several of you have seen this chart before. Now, normally when I speak in the UK, most people have arrived in a car. Here, most of us have flown. But just look at that. In flying to Las Vegas, you've relied on significantly less computing power than a modern high-end car. What we're seeing here is 100 million lines of code involved in these devices. Now, I didn't know that when I drive to work, I'm in control of a supercomputer. I mean, based on this, my ability to drive means I could actually go to the moon, because look at the space shuttle right down the bottom there. Barely anything. So secretly and without us knowing, automation has crept into our lives and taken over. We didn't even know it. Who did that? Consumer goods have already given us access to this stuff and changed our mindsets. And we see that also in our economics. So in 2005, the University of Birmingham estimated that street works, so for us to maintain the buried assets, we have to dig roads. In the UK, we call it street works, cost our economy 7 billion per annum. Negative, not positive. We didn't contribute 7 billion to the economy. We took 7 billion out of it. By 2017, University of Salford has estimated a two-minute delay costs us 1% of our GDP. Now, a street works requires me to stall the traffic. I don't stop every car for two minutes, but every car I do stop, I stop for more than two minutes. 1% of UK GDP is £20 billion a year. So I've tripled the negative impact on my economy in only a bit over the same time as we've digitized and brought supercomputing into our vehicles that we drive to work in. 
This means that social expectations have changed and our activities are no longer socially acceptable to people. It is not acceptable to our customers to dig up the roads outside their house while they're trying to get to work. And the reason it's not acceptable is because I have a negative impact on the economy because I reduce productivity. I stop you taking your children to school, I stop you getting to work on time, I make you late for meetings, I'm closing down factories. This is not acceptable any longer. And here's a com real comparison. So inspired by the papal inauguration, I did some Googling, the source of all knowledge in the world, and I searched for Streetworks in the UK 2005, and I gave us a fighting chance, because we're construction, I know we move a bit slower. And then I looked for Streetworks in the UK 2017. Can anybody, is there, is there like a sign or barrier nerd out there, somebody who's really up on their high-vis clothing, spot the difference between the 2005 image and the 2017 image? I can't. And what that tells us is that the Catholic Church has moved faster to digitize than the construction industry. And I don't think that's acceptable. And there is an alternative. So one of the universities in the UK is leading a research program for zero streetworks by 2050, and we're collaborating with them to do it. Now, what's really interesting is that in targeting this, they believe the future is using robotic and autonomous systems to repair our infrastructure before it's broken. And actually, this is the University of Leeds, and the City of Leeds Council came to them and said, you are unambitious. 2050 is not soon enough for this. We want it by 2035. Imagine that. A government institution is more ambitious than our leading academics and our industry. Again, who knew? So how we're contributing to take this forward to achieve no street works, no disruption, save the economy 20 billion a year in that time frame? Well, as a construction company, we've done something a bit odd. We sponsored UK Robotics Week, the second one, and no, I didn't know there'd been a first one either. But this year, we sponsored a grand challenge, an international challenge, to find practical robotics today to help us improve resilient infrastructure. We contributed to a white paper and along with Kia, there was only Arup, the only other uh, organisation from construction that engaged with Leeds University to do this. And down here is a quote that my boss put into it, Paul Fletcher. He really should check his emails if he wants to know what his public persona is saying to people. But that's the quote that we got in there. The thing is that we spotted we need to do this because in the UK, our government invests only 5% of all research funding in robotics to robotics in infrastructure and construction. The remaining 95% goes to pharma and medicine. But I would argue, and we did argue in the paper, that construction has a greater negative impact on the economy and the movement of people and goods and services than pharma and medicine does. So we're encouraging greater spend on the research. We're doing more because the advanced robotics that we're seeing here are not available to us right now in the field. And we need to take some simple steps to get there earlier. So what we've done is we've taken some existing technologies that we use in the field work, some compressed air guns, some directional drilling, some vacuum excavators, great big hoovers in the field. We've put some seismic sensors in to the bottom of our excavations, and we've reduced our time on site from four and a half days to three and a half hours. So we turn up outside your home while you're at work, we get in below the ground, we repair the fault that you're suffering, we reinstate that hole and we relay the tarmac and when you come back, the worst case scenario is you've got a new piece of road surface, best case you've just got a little thin line of grout outside your house. And you've got a calling card from us through the letterbox saying, hey, while you're at work, we're sorry you had some disruption, you may have experienced it, you may not, but we fixed it already, we hope it wasn't too inconvenient for you. And we've done that using things that are available to us in the field today. And we've done it because we can't wait until this great technology comes into the field and we need to take some baby steps right now and change the culture. And I want to move on to just talk about that's the how. But the real question is the who. Who is going to achieve this for us? So up on the top there, all those youngsters in high vis this is how we generally try and encourage the youth of today, the next generation engineers and construction professionals to come into our industry. And you know what? They love coming onto our sites. They have a great time with us and they talk about it. We give them free gifts and all sorts of things and we let them sit on diggers and they really have a good time. 
But by the time they get to be teenagers and you walk into their classroom and say, hey, everybody remember that great day out you had on the construction site? Who wants to come now and learn how to tarmac roads and dig holes for a living? You know how many hands go up? Not one. We lose that generation between there and the teenage years. And what we need to do is get closer to this one. So this is a great image that I pulled off last week. So this is our Prime Minister, and that's um, a young girl. And basically, this is a school's program to introduce an interest in robotics in school schools. So rather than bringing them to construction sites, showing them that robotics are the face of construction. Well, what I love about this is, look at the, well, actually, there's two things. One, there's two women involved in construction in the same space. That's really unusual. But look at the little girl. Look at the glee on her face. She's having so much fun. And look at our Prime Minister's face, right? I mean, that looks like the face of some of the executives in our boardroom when I go and brief them about robotics. They just don't understand it. And actually, what I need to do is explain to them and ask them, how do you communicate with your teenage children? And they go, oh, yeah, they're in their bedrooms. I send them WhatsApp. I'm on Snapchat. They won't actually talk to me. I have to go digital to see my children. And that's the way we build the understanding to know that if we want to bring the next generation in, we can't do any more of that up there. We have to change to get into this mode here and suck them up now so they can come into the field with the right mindset to accept the great technologies we're seeing here and elsewhere around the world. Because otherwise it feels unreal, theoretical, conceptual. We've got to get it out of the labs and into the field. And we need to help our executives not pull faces like that when they see something new. So that's it. That's my message to you. In summary, there are social and economic reasons why we need to move to automation. I think society is ready. I don't think we are ready, but we can move towards it through baby steps. Understand what our people are capable of and what they want, what matters to them, and they will accept it and absorb it and pull it through into the field. And we must invest time in our really young people so that when they are making decisions about their future, they really, really want to come in and work in our industry using this technology and adapting it to make the world a better place for the people that we serve. Thanks very much for your time.